Hi everyone, Liz here from The Nail Hub, and I wanted to follow up my last video talking about HEMA and nail allergies by talking about nail lamps, because beyond our gel formulas or even our acrylic or our dip systems or our poly gel systems, the most important part when it comes to actually working with any type of product that polymerizes is making sure that it polymerizes to safe levels. When we're talking about UV cured gels, or even poly gel type systems that are cured in a UV lamp, we wanna make sure that the product is being polymerized to safe levels. And I'll get into what polymerization means in just a second, but essentially it's what we're talking about when we talk about curing and all of that. So I've got three lamps here just to kind of show you as we progress through this, this tutorial. And I've got some really important kind of pre precursor uh, items that I wanted to correct that are very, very common when it comes to misinformation. So let's talk about the first big piece of it, misinformation that's out there that a lot of people think, which is UV is different than LED. So when we talk about UV LED lamps, which again, some of these lamps that I just was showing you are culprits of that. Right here, it shows UV LED on here. And a lot of our gel products will be listed as UV slash LED, which makes us think that there's some kind of alternative. When in fact, the correct differentiation when we're talking about nail lamps is CFL versus LED. CFL is compact fluorescent, similar to the type of tube bulbs that you might see in your laundry room ceiling, or maybe you've seen them in more old school nail lamps. They look like a white type of uh, light bulb and they have kind of a glass tube on them. When we're talking about LEDs, we're talking about light emitting diodes. So let me show you what a light emitting diode looks like. These are very low quality light emitting diodes, but this is what it'll look like if you have an LED style lamp. This also has LEDs, three very small ones here. And this lamp here has light emitting diodes as well with a sort of disc reflector around it. Sorry, my nail lamp is so dirty, but this one gets handled a lot. Um, and so you'll see the different light emitting diodes like down here in the middle. And also these ones in the center is the, there's actually two light emitting diodes in there for the different wavelengths, but it's got kind of this little disc amplifier reflector around the edges of it, okay? So all of these lamps, whether they use compact fluorescent bulbs or they use light emitting diodes, they're emitting UVA light or very near UVA light. And I'll get into that in just a second. So there is no way to get around UV light when we're talking about products that are UV sensitive and need UV light to be cured, like polygels and gel systems. They need UV light in order to polymerize. Okay. Higher wattage. Wattage is not an actual direct indicator of how powerful your lamp is or how well it's going to cure your products. And I'll get into that in a second. Wattage, as it's usually listed on anything that we see out there on the marketplace when we're shopping for nail lamps, that wattage is typically speaking about the energy consumption or sometimes a combination of the output and the energy consumption. But wattage is a terrible metric that we have come to rely on when shopping for lamps. And it just doesn't clearly communicate what we're looking for, unfortunately. And last but not least, when it comes to correcting misinformation is that lamps are not universal, okay? So when we think of, you know, oh, I'm just gonna grab whatever lamp to cure my products, that does not work. Lamps are not universal, they are not created equal, and we need to make sure we understand the implications of our lamp choice because that's going to have a direct effect on how uh, well our product cures. And I'll get into all of that detail in just a second. Okay, so with these things in mind, let's proceed into some more detail. In order for our gels to properly polymerize or cure and harden to safe levels, which means that chemically, at a chemical level, they don't just feel hard, but they actually are fully chemically processed or at least chemically processed to very safe levels. Just like what I was talking about in my last video on the nail allergies and what's causing nail allergies, that free floating monomer, the unreacted monomer in our product is where this comes into play, okay? So our gels rely on something called photo initiators. Photo initiators, you can think of them as the thing that sets off the actual chemical reaction. Photo initiators, like the word photo, they are sensitive to light. And so they get energy from the light source that we provide to them. They get powered up and then they 
physically transfer that power or that energy into the chemical process and start that polymerization reaction as well as help to complete it. So we definitely need the correct wavelength and I'll talk about wavelengths in just a second, but you'll probably have already seen this when you've come across maybe looking at different types of nail lamps. You'll typically see gels and lamps that list something like 365 to 405 nanometers. And that basically is speaking to the photo initiators that are in the gel or the wavelengths of light that are being emitted by the lamp. And we need those things to be aligned in order for our product to properly cure. We also need intensity. So when we talk about intensity of light, we talk about how much actual wattage is being emitted by the lamp and is being used to create energy to help with that curing process. We also need quantity of light. So how much light is being produced, right? And again, quantity and intensity can sometimes be misconstrued as the same thing, but you can have a lot of light and have it be, you know, very low energy, depending on the distance, depending on, you know, how that's being focused. Um, and if we think about, you know, for example, a laser beam versus a floodlight, right, the intensity is not going to be as strong between a laser beam and a floodlight because the light is being kind of dispersed a across a greater area and maybe from further away. So intensity has to do with how focused that light is and how much is actually being directly uh, put into the energy. And then the quantity is how much energy are we able to produce, okay? How much energy are we able to emit in order to get that curing process to function? And also proximity. And you guys have probably maybe subconsciously come across this or you know maybe you've already realized this is that you'll notice that nail lamps tend to be very compact, right? It's not usually a big machine that has a lot of space inside. And we've gotten very smart about the proximity because we can take that intensity and that quantity and that wavelength and we can make it super efficient by making sure that we're doing it in a smaller space. So all of these four things, in addition to time exposure, are really what go into optimal cure levels, okay? And that's also where those recommendations on 30 second cure times or 60 second cure times, or maybe two minutes, three minutes, whatever it might be for a given product. The cure time is also a big component of this, but this is what our products need. So it's not just wattage of lamps. It's not just making sure that you have a lamp and a gel. There's a lot that goes into this and we need to remember that it's a chemical process that's happening. So with any chemical process, we need to be very savvy about what's going on. We need to be very careful about what's going on and we need to be diligent on what we're, we're looking at and what we're choosing. Okay, so talking about wavelengths, because some of you guys might be curious about this, and I'm just going to give you kind of a, a high level breakdown on this, is if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, which is basically a whole litany of energy wavelengths from, you know, radio waves that we use for radio listening in our cars, all the way up to x-rays and gamma rays and things like that, all of these different wavelengths have different energy levels. And when we're talking about curing UV gel nail products, we are using somewhere in that range between 365 nanometers to about 405 nanometers. So depending on the formula and depending on the lamp, we need to align those two things to make sure that our gel is getting activated properly, okay? All right, so let's take a comparison of lamps and I'm just gonna go back to my table just for a quick second. So the first comparison I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna move this guy out of the way for just a second. The first comparison I wanted to do is actually kind of a, an interesting one because most people when visually looking at this would assume that this lamp is gonna be more high powered and more uh, potent than a mini style lamp. And I know there's tons of mini style lamps on the market. This one is a very special one. This is the Light Elegance Mini Dot. I love this lamp because it has full power, just as if it was a full size lamp, but it's in a mini, mini size. And this is the one I often recommend to people who are looking for something that's more portable, or maybe they wanna have something that they can do their nails at home, um, anything like that. Even if you're working in a salon and you wanna have a little mini lamp you can whip out and do pedicures without having a full size lamp, this is a great option for stuff like that. So the portability is wonderful, but it does have full power even in this small format, okay? And this guy is what we would consider a full size lamp but I'm gonna show you the data points on this guy versus this guy. Okay, so the LE Mini Dot 
produces 45 milliwatts per centimeter squared, which basically is kind of talking about that intensity and that output. So, you know, without getting into the whole volume inside of the lamp and all of that, but on one square centimeter of space, 45 milliwatts of, of output are being put on that area. And when we multiply that by how many seconds of exposure we're exposing our gel to, that's where you start to get into millijoules or even joules of energy. And we know that energy is measured in joules. So again, without getting too technical, basically what this is telling me is the, uh, the curing power or the curing potential of this lamp, okay? So without understanding what these numbers mean, let's just do a straight comparison. So the mini dot costs just under $60. It's a six watt lamp, which most of you who have been hunting or, or shopping for lamps out there on the market would go six watts, that's not gonna cure anything. Well, if we compare that to this quote unquote Sun X5 lamp, which this Sun X5 lamp is interesting because I found multiple iterations of it with multiple private label names on it, ranging anywhere from $15 to $30. You can find it all over the internet if you just search for this Sun X5. I have no idea who actually makes it. It's just one of those generic kind of cheapo plastic lamps that I was able to come across. I purchased one online. And just straight numbers wise, the LE Mini Dot, which is a teeny tiny mini lamp, has almost twice as much curing power when it comes to the wattage that's actually being emitted than this big full-size Sun X5, okay? And what's interesting is this Sun X5 is advertised as an 80 watt nail lamp. So if we were shopping based on wattage and thinking that a bigger number is better, we would opt for the 80 watt lamp at $28.99 and think, oh, that's great, that's gonna cure all my stuff and it's cheap, but it's actually got almost half the curing power of this Light Elegance Mini Dot, okay? So even with the same cure times of 60 seconds, you can see that the actual joules of energy is more than chopped in half. And, uh, and that's a pretty crazy comparison. And again, you guys don't necessarily need to know what milliwatts per centimeter squared or millijoules per centimeter squared actually means, but just showing you just if these are the metrics that we're actually able to measure energy output and, and how much energy is actually being applied to curing the nails, this is a pretty drastic comparison just to have kind of a, an eyeball on. All right, so let's take one more, the Accents Hybrid Pro uh, nail lamp, which is the other one that I showed you at the beginning of this video. That is another professional grade lamp. It's a full size lamp this time instead of a mini one. And this one is a dual wavelength, which means that it emits the full spectrum from 365 all the way up to about 400 or 405. So the dual spectrum thing is only really important if you're curing older style gels. If you're talking about gels that were made you know, somewhere between seven and 10 years ago, they'll be listed as UV only, which again is a misnomer, but those UV only style gels are what rely on that 365 nanometer wavelength type of area on the spectrum. And if we don't have that, then we can't cure those older style gels. Most of the gels on the market now are what are called LED gels or, you know, something like that. Uh, those are the ones that are 400, 405 nanometer gels. Most of the modern formulas are going to be LED style gels. Again, the LED UV thing is a total misnomer, but when you're looking at gels, if the gel says it's UV only, it will need a dual spectrum or full spectrum or broad spectrum lamp like a hybrid lamp, okay? Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background on that. So Accents Hybrid Pro, this is a very powerful lamp, very professional grade lamp. Uh, expensive to boot, right? It's 250 bucks. This is intended for salon use. Uh, it's geared towards professionals. You definitely get what you pay for because even with 36 watts uh, listed on here for the consumption, it actually outputs 108 milliwatts per centimeter squared and 60, almost 6,400 millijoules per centimeter squared of energy on a 60 second cure time whereas the Sun X5 is still at that 25 milliwatts per centimeter squared, okay? So more than four times more energy being put into the gel curing process than the Sun X5. And I just wanted to kind of show you this as a comparison between the two. So how do we figure out if our lamp is curing our products properly, right? Well, one of the things that we can measure to figure out if the curing process is happening and how well it's happening is we can measure heat. 
So heat is a byproduct of polymerization. It's, it's not molecules moving. It's not molecular friction. It's not any of that. It's actually just a chemical byproduct of this polymerization reaction. And heat is released as part of that chemical reaction. Let me show you a really nifty tool that helps me measure this actual chemical reaction. And this is something that I got from Mr. Doug Shoon of Shoon Scientific. He made me this kind of prototype. This is a calorimeter. Calorimeter is a very fancy word for a heat meter. So what this does is it measures heat and these wires are put into different gel samples or they could even be put into different lamps for that matter. And the different ones on here, basically what we're doing is we're trying to measure the actual temperature that's happening inside of the gel. So we're subtracting out the lamp temperature, we're subtracting out maybe even the room temperature. This little guy here measures the actual ambient room temperature. So inside of this room that I'm sitting in, we have one, one little um, wire that is measuring the temperature of, let's say, the lamp, the interior of the lamp, because the lamp does get warm while all that energy is being produced. And then we have other wires that we can put, you know, two different gel samples. We can put, you know, different lamps if we want to. We can run these different experiments with this calorimeter. So this is a very sensitive, very expensive instrument. Um, but we want it to be very sensitive because we want to be able to measure very, very small changes in temperature and really get a very accurate reading on the temperature. If you guys watched my other video that was more of a simplistic version of this, I showed you how to do this with just a simple thermometer, digital thermometer with the different little um, readouts here. And I'm able to do the temperature differential between two different samples, less sensitive, however, just as you know, important when it comes to getting a general idea of how well your gels are curing. So this is um, one of the experiments I did before. This is basically just taking that experiment and going full bore scientific level with it with very, very hypersensitive instruments. And what does this show us? Well, what it does is it measures the heat that's produced across a curing exposure, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, if we go and we expose our gel to 60 seconds of curing time, it will measure the temperature change in that gel. So as the gel starts to polymerize, we can measure kind of a peak heat in the gel. And then as the lamp turns off, you'll see that the temperature will greatly decrease. So these colors here, blue is uh, one of the lamps that I was testing. Green is another lamp that I was testing. Yellow is the average lamp temperature between those two. This isn't as specific as doing two samples in the same lamp but I just wanted to kind of show you the same gel in two different lamps that have similar interior temperatures as they increase. And when that gets subtracted out, basically how well each lamp is curing that same gel. So in this experiment, what we're doing is we're exposing the gel to 60 seconds of curing at a time, and we're also letting the gel completely cool down. After five full 60 second exposures with the cool down period, so when we're talking about a 60 second cure, that's actually a 10 minute reading. And when we're talking about five cycles, that's actually a 50 minute total experiment that we're doing when we're exposing the gel to 60 seconds of UV light at a time. Okay, just to kind of give you a breakdown on that. Traditionally, what's interesting about this is traditionally we are used to curing our gels in an LED style lamp for 30 seconds, maybe even less than 30 seconds, depending on what the manufacturer tells us. What's interesting about this is if we did this for actually 30 seconds instead of 60, these numbers I'm going to go through would actually be even lower than what I'm showing you here. Okay. So 60 seconds is what Doug has come up with as the minimum recommended cure time for any gel on the market, because what he has found in a lot of these experiments is that 30 seconds is not even close to what we need on one single exposure. 60 seconds is the new minimum recommendation, regardless of what the lamp or the gel says. Some of you might be asking, well, how does that affect over curing? Over curing is literally the least of your concerns. So don't worry about over curing. I want you guys to really be more concerned about under curing because that's where we get that unreacted monomer situation. That's where we start to have concerns about what's on our nails. Even if they feel cured and hard, 
we've got chemically unreacted stuff that can leach out of our product and get onto our bodies, okay? And also when we're removing or filing or any of that as nail technicians, that's also one of our bigger concerns. So after a 60 second cure cycle, and again with the nine minute cool down period, which is what I just showed you guys on that previous slide, the Accents Hybrid Pro Lamp with Accents Shine On Top Coat, so same brand of lamp and same brand of top coat, was 98.3% cured after just one single 60 second exposure to the lamp. That's a really, really good number. Uh, typical safe levels, when we talk about like average safe levels of curing are somewhere like in the 70s to 80s. So, you know, we consider it to be satisfactorily or safely or lower risk when it's something like 70 to 80% cured. The fact that this lamp is curing its own top coat at 98.3% on the first exposure at 60 seconds is absolutely fabulous. If we compare that to the Sun X5 lamp with accent shine on top coat, so same top coat, just different lamp, this lamp only cured it to 63.4%. So what this shows us is when somebody says, hey, use the lamp that goes with your system, that's for a reason most of the time. And also there's a drastic difference in how well our gel will cure depending on the lamp that we're using, okay? Now, is that to say that you couldn't use another high quality lamp? Could I do this with, for example, the LE Mini Dot or the LE Gen 3 or the Cocoas Infinity, all of those lamps that we saw on the Nail Hub? I've actually tested some of them so far and so far the gel is all curing to safe levels. So even if I was to put Accent Shine on top coat inside of another high quality lamp, I'm getting similar numbers so far. But what the real issue is, is when we go for a generic cheapo lamp, that's where the numbers really start to fall apart, okay? So that means that almost 40% of that product, even though it feels hard to the touch, chemically, 40% of it is still unreacted. So that is where we get that risk of unreacted monomer leaching out of our product, even while we're wearing it, and the potential for creating those allergies in our bodies. So after five cycles, which is five minutes of UV exposure followed by cool down periods, so that is 50 minutes of total experiment time, it is 99.1% cured with the Accents Shine On and the Accents Hybrid Pro Lamp and it only gets to 87.4 with the Sun X5, okay? And also, who is literally going to sit there and cure their nails for five minutes per layer? Nobody. And that's also something that we also don't wanna be doing because all of that overexposure also is happening with our skin and all of that. We wanna make sure that we're doing an efficient cure on the product on our nails without even overexposing our hands to heat or this energy that's being produced by our lamp. And, you know, again, and even the damage on our lamps, you know, electrical components, all this excess heat. So the five minutes becomes a, a bad number across the board. Um, some of you might be wondering, why isn't it 100% cured after five full cycles? So at a certain point, our amount of photo initiators or maybe even the layer that we applied, you know, with the amount of chemicals that are inside of that layer that we applied, plus the monomers that are in there and all of that formula and the UV exposure and all that, at a certain point, the polymerization reaction is just going to kind of peter out. And it doesn't matter if we were to continue this for 50 cycles, we may never get to 100%. But what we have found chemically is that after about, you know, 80% cured, that is something that we have found that greatly mitigates the risk of unreacted monomers from leaching out of the formula. And it creates a well-cured, well-performing um, well enhancement, whatever that might be. So we get that longevity, we get the shine, we get all of those things that we're looking for when it comes to a gel manicure or a UV-cured product manicure and uh, without all of the risk that comes along with that. Okay, so this is a really, really important thing to understand and to look at. And I hope this helps to illustrate why when I say generic lamps are not the same as high-quality lamps, um, that this is, you know, this clearly demonstrates what's happening at a chemical level. All right, so after all of this data, some of you are probably just like, wow, this is a lot more information than I will ever be able to absorb or do anything with, or this is overwhelming. I totally get that. 
I don't expect you guys to become scientists overnight. And honestly, it's not really your job to do this, but I wanted to do some of this to help demonstrate the meaning behind a lot of these concepts. So what are the key takeaways for you? What are, you know, if, if Liz was to boil down my five recommendations on how to really mitigate risk when it comes to working with products out there without having to know about all the chemical stuff, without having to know about all the SDS and all of the lamp experiments and all of the polymerization reaction know-how, how would you as a layman be able to, you know, just come up with five rules of operation for greatly mitigating and decreasing the risk of you developing allergies with products? Here are my key takeaways in addition to the ones that I mentioned in my previous video. So beyond, you know, the whole formula conversation and again, not just consuming random things on the marketplace, you know, looking for companies that you can trust, maybe, you know, utilizing a company like the Nail Hub that curates these things, that puts a lot of this research into what we are reselling, looking for manufacturers that are doing this as well. That's one big part of it. But in addition, what I think you guys should definitely start doing is curing things for 60 seconds, regardless of what the recommended time is on the product, okay? And again, the over curing conversation, I know that a lot of you may have come across conversations about, oh, don't over cure your product because it could you know, be brittle or whatever. Honestly, at the end of the day, I think that the 60 second cure time, which Doug also has uh, just recently come out with, those official recommendations as well. I think it's a great metric for people to adjust to. And it's something that we can simply do to help increase the amount of polymerization that's happening in our products without knowing a lot of what's happening beyond that, okay? Secondly is get a high quality lamp. Any of the lamps we sell in the Nail Hub are already vetted. We go through this experimentation ourselves. Not everybody is doing this. Not everybody cares. We care. So this is something we are doing with all of our nail lamps. Um, some of them, you know, the, the, the LED dot, we try to put, you know, information on the website about what's a full power, but small format lamp. Some of the lamps we sell are meant for flash curing, whether it be for full coverage tip application or flash curing nail art pieces into place before you put your hand in a lamp. Um, but what's important here is just getting a high quality lamp. So some of you might be asking, well, how the heck, you know, if I don't buy something from the nail hub and I have no idea where to start, how do I know that something's high quality? All right, so let's just do a quick comparison between what I consider a high quality lamp and the, what I would look for versus a low quality lamp. All right, so both of these lamps have bases to them. Let me move my little sticky guys. So this lamp over here comes with a metal base. Again, this lamp has been through hell and back, so forgive the fingerprints and the scratchy marks. This is one that I use a lot. Um, so this lamp is what I would consider is a high quality lamp. This lamp is what I would consider a low quality lamp. And you can see some drastic differences between the two. So let's kind of compare. This one has a plastic interior. Even the base is plastic. It's very flimsy, lightweight plastic. I mean, literally, if I just hold this, it feels as light of a, as a feather. This thing feels like an actual machine to me. It's got weight to it. So just even looking at kind of general plastic versus metal and weight uh, kind of gives me an idea of the quality. Also, the yellow color of these LEDs and also the shape of them. If I zoom in really quick, I'll show you what I mean. So if you look at the shape of these LEDs, they look like a little kind of plastic yellow dome. These are what are referred to as bubble LEDs. Bubble LEDs tend to be very low grade when it comes to the actual quality of the light emitting diode. And the cap that's put on top, although it's meant to try and intensify the light that's being output, outputted, it, it really, these are very, very low quality. So if you have a lamp that's like this, that's white plastic or even black plastic or any kind of plastic, and it has these kind of yellow looking, bubbly looking LEDs, even if it's a whole field of them, even if there's a hundred of them in there, lamps like that typically are not going to be very high quality. So this is a great kind of visual for you to look for when you're out there shopping. Obviously price point is gonna be something that's kind of obvious. Most of the lamps that look like this are gonna be sub 50 or $40 USD. That's a dead giveaway as well. You don't have to spend $250 on a lamp, but you do want something that's gonna look more like this. Also, one other thing that's important about nail lamps that you can look for is most of the high quality nail lamps are made in Taiwan, not in China. So if you see a nail lamp that's been made in Taiwan, that's also usually a really good indicator that is higher quality than an alternative. Um, if it says made in China, that is usually a cheaper alternative and lower quality, okay? 
And then as far as the actual outside, most of them are gonna be similar. They're gonna have some kind of digital output. They're gonna have some timer buttons. They're gonna have an on off switch. They're gonna have a power port. I mean, that's very typical. You know, some of them might have things like a low heat mode where it gradually builds up the intensity. But a lot of these features are meaningless if the actual function of the lamp is not happening with the output. So don't get bought into lots of little features on the outside or, you know, sensors, timers, things like that, because all of that's really going to be meaningless if your lamp isn't actually curing things. All right, so those are some low hanging fruit items that you can look for when it comes to shopping for high quality lamps and what I mean by high quality. Um, as we talked about last time, you know, watch for just straight monomers in your products. If you see HEMA, which HEMA, HEA, HPMA, IBOA, any of those as the first ingredients, or if you see HEMA followed by HEA as the first two ingredients, just listed just like that, or you can Google the, um, the acronyms, you know, hydroxyethyl methacrylate, uh, hydroxyethyl acrylate. Um, if you know, you can look up what these are depending on the ingredient list on the bottle or on the SDS. Sometimes they'll be spelt out. Sometimes they will just be the acronym, but if you see them just alone, no number leading them, no bis, no die, no nothing. Um, this is straight monomer. And so you want to avoid products that have this as the first ingredient because the ingredients are listed in the amount of quantity in the, like as a percentage of the total formula. So if something is listed first, it usually means it's going to be more than 50% of the actual formula. Um, and that's what we want to stay away from. Okay. So you can always check in the SDS to get more detail, but if you're just looking on the actual bottle or on the ingredients list and you see any of these things listed first on the ingredients, that is usually something I try to avoid just as again, a low hanging fruit key takeaway. I also recommend you look for formulas that start with bis. So you'll notice on something like a light elegance gel, it'll say bis HEA. And it will also spell out, you know, it'll say something like bis HEMA, bis HEA, and it'll have an IPDI copolymer, which means it's part of an oligomer chain. IPDI is a chemical used to create those oligomer chains. It's the connector. Um, but bis means that it is two complex structures being attached together instead of two simple, uh, simple structures. So instead of it just being two monomers, like a dimer, it's actually two already complex structures being added together, which is a bigger molecular structure than regular monomer, straight monomer. And it's also a more complex structure than even the dye uh, versions of these. So if you see dye HEMA, that's better than straight HEMA, but that means it's just two HEMA monomers, you know, attached together. It's not a more complex structure like bis HEMA. Okay. So if you were to put them in order of risky to low risk, riskier would be straight HEMA, middle would be dye HEMA, and very low risk would be bis HEMA. Okay. So those are things that you can look for. And that uh, prefix applies to all of those monomers. So it could be bis HEA, it could be bis HEMA, it could be bis HPMA, uh, dye HEA, dye HEMA, any of those things. But that is the order in which those things are kind of listed. And it just talks to the actual molecular structure and the size of those molecular structures. And the bigger the molecule, the more difficult it is to get absorbed into our body. And it also lends itself to better curing as well because there's less reaction sites um, than if we're talking about straight monomer. And last but not least, ask questions and review what you own, okay? So these are my key takeaways coming out of these two videos. Remember that it's both the formula as well as the lamp that we're using. Those two things are very important to put together. I hope these two videos have given you a little bit of a data download on these topics and given you some food for thought and given you some kind of red flags to look for. And as always, I am here to answer any questions. We are very serious about this conversation here at the Nail Hub. We are happy to answer any questions you might have about specific things you're dealing with. And I hope all of this is extremely helpful to you now and in the future. All right. Thank you so much. See you guys next time. Bye. Thank you.